Hello friends, James Corbett here, CorbettReport.com, June 13th, 2017, and recently, former Corbett Report guest Jerry Day, uh, aka Minivan Jack, up on YouTube, posted this video to his YouTube channel, Jerry's Challenge, After the Fed, What? I have a challenge for some people I admire. James Corbett, G. Edward Griffin, Ron Paul. Catherine Austin Fitz, or any other good journalist, researcher, or economist who can answer this question. How are we supposed to end the Fed? All right. Well, excellent and important question. Now, this is a seven-minute video, so uh, rather than play it all, of course, I will direct you to the, watch the uh, the full video where Jerry lays out his questions and comments and his thoughts and uh, his challenge and his own ideas and asking for other people's ideas in gr a great degree of detail. But I wanted to break down just just a few of the points that he makes in this video and then uh, offer you the the short answer and the, the somewhat unfulfilling short answer and the somewhat uh, more fulfilling longer answer, question mark? Well, at any rate, let's get into it. For example, one of the first statements that Jerry makes in the video is... We've heard that term as a mantra for years, end the Fed, but no one seems to have a good way to set about doing that. Well... I humbly beg to differ. Uh, if you go back to the archives, interview 928, in fact, I had an entire podcast uh, episode basically about this. James Corbett discusses voluntary solutions to ending the Fed, where we talk about that term, end of the Fed, and what that actually means, because of course it is more than a mantra, and there are genuine questions about what it actually means to end the Fed, because of course, in the long run of the globalist agenda, Ending the Fed is ultimately going to be part of that globalist agenda. It is, of course, as Jerry goes on to point out in this video, a question of, well, what does that mean? How do we go about ending it? <clears throat> and in what way we end it very much will portend what ultimately comes of that. So that is one of the subjects that we, we discuss in great detail in this uh, conversation on the Greening Out podcast. I hope you will go into the archives and listen to this full conversation. It's only one hour on a subject that we could talk about for hundreds of hours, but at any rate, it does get into some of the issues that I think uh, Jerry is raising and addressing in his video. Um, moving along, uh, here's another interesting point that Jerry makes. And in the meantime, how do we keep government from meddling in that with some crooked stunt such as confiscation or devaluation as has been done in the past? Well, this is an important point to make in the context of this question. So Jerry's talking about different ideas for what we can do to, well, after the Federal Reserve note system that we're living in, the U.S. fiat dollar system, what, what, what do we replace it with? And how do we assure that that thing that we replace it with isn't ultimately undermined by the government taking, you know, taking actions to undermine it, counterfeiting or uh, subverting or confiscating or whatever, making laws against it. And I think that addresses one of the very, very, very key points of this entire issue, something that is actually raised as the first point in the comments thread on this video, which I think is important. Uh, I, I fully agree with this comment. The problems that we are dealing with are not a monetary issue, but a social issue. Every monetary system can and will be subverted and distorted, including gold and silver. We need to grow up and think outside the box. I, I agree with that sentiment, and I, I think that comports with what Jerry is attempting to express here, which is the fact that whatever system or s currency or solution we come up with in the monetary paradigm is going to be circumscribed within a certain political context. And the question of that political context is not ancillary to the question of what solutions are even thinkable or possible. So I think this has to be a multiple front project. It cannot simply be monetary reform as simply a monetary issue. It is a social issue. It is it is a uh, it's a technological issue as well, as well. I mean, money is fundamentally a social technology. It is both of those factors together. And so I think we have to understand it in that context. The idea that, that ultimately negates the idea that there is going to be a system that somehow magically will circumvent all of those controls and all of those things. Even people who argue for cryptocurrency as the decentralized system through peer-to-peer -peer that cannot be stopped by governments. Well, I have uh, examples here in Japan of how, no, I mean, they physically can't stop you from sending strings of letters and numbers to other people unless they physically come and confiscate your, your computer or physically shut down the internet. But they certainly can circumscribe the ways in which cryptocurrency is illegally allowed to be used so that right now, 
I can tell you right now in Japan, all of the Bitcoin ATMs, or at least all the ones I know about, have been shut down while the Bitcoin ATM owners figure out how to comport with the new laws that make Bitcoin illegal money. Because now, of course, you have to know your customer. You have to get seven different forms of ID. So I know Bitcoin ATMs here in Japan have been shut down while they're trying to figure out what's going on. So even as it becomes a legal currency, now, of course, that means it's circumscribed with all sorts of rules and laws. And of course, you can go around those laws and there are ways of getting around it. But it does technically make you a criminal. So everything is circumscribed within a political context. That is extremely important to understand with regards to this debate. Uh, Let's move on to another, I think, extremely important point and one that we really do need to address. So by asking the right questions, I believe we can approach and find some solutions. How do we institute real money without intrinsic debt without crippling tax consequences and institutional tyrannies. What is the path? What would that currency or medium of exchange look like? Would it come into common and practical use easily? How would it smoothly and finally displace the Federal Reserve note and restore economic health to the American economy? How can we be sure that our currency will never be debased, controlled, or manipulated? These things can be done, We just have to agree on some particular approach to do it. If enough of us agree, we can do anything we want. We just have to make a choice and be willing to compromise a little to get the job done. Hmm. Well, I understand what Jerry is saying here, and I understand the perspective that he's coming from. And I don't mean to take, again, I'm not trying to take these particular comments out of context. I hope people will watch the full video. But I do disagree. I I think in the sense that what is the way this question is being formed is assuming a certain type of conclusion. Namely, that there is a currency that we are going to agree on. We might have to compromise our principles, beliefs, and ideals in order to do so. But, you know, a little bit of compromise is a good thing. And we'll come together and agree on a currency that will smoothly and finally get rid of the Federal Reserve and restore economic health of the United States. Well, I'm in Japan. I'm Canadian in Japan, so hopefully it'll have some good effects here as well. Um, but again, that's a question. Well, uh, well, what about in Japan? I mean, obviously, ending the Fed is not a question for the Japanese people, so it would be ending the Bank of Japan, I guess, and the Japanese yen. But would that be a simultaneous process? Could this happen in different pl- parts of the globe in different ways and over different time periods? And how would those different currencies interact with each other? I mean, this is a, a vastly more complex question than simply ending the Fed, if you really want to spool it out. And again, I think that the the danger here is taking the mindset that has been engineered into us specifically in the past century of the Federal Reserve System and the idea of this central bank-dominated singular fiat currency that is dictated at a centralized controlled level to believe that the only thing that can replace that system is another singular centralized currency that operates in a certain way with certain bureaucratic procedures and there must be some sort of institution or at least a, some sort of community agreement. Everyone will have to get on board with this and you might have to compromise your ideals in order to do so, but that's just the way it is. I think, again, that's assuming the conclusion and it's assuming a conclusion that does not have to be so and, in fact, should not be so. Because, again, absolutely any and every system, once it is systematized, can be gamed, it can be exploited, it can be circumvented, it can be undermined, it can be co-opted, and it will be. If, if history shows anything, it is that the oligarchs are exceptionally good at taking systems and doing all of those things to them. So, maybe the, the actual answer here is not to come up with the singular, one-size-fits-all, we must have a single currency that simultaneously fulfills all three functions of money. It is a store of value. It is a unit of exchange. It is a unit of measure. We have to do all of these things and it it, will all agree to it and we'll all use it in all of our transactions all the time. Hmm, Why? Why on earth should that be the case? Why on earth can it not be the case that we have not one or two or three, but many, many competing forms of currency that people can choose from in different aspects of their life. And why can it not be the case that it isn't even necessarily a question of, okay, let's have lots of different ideas and they compete and winner takes all. 
why does the winner have to take all? It is not a 100% or 0% po proposition. There can be slices of the pie. I choose to interact with these people in this community in this way using this form of currency. I choose to interact with the people in this other community in this other way, in this other type of transaction using a different form of currency. Why on earth do we have to have the one-size-fits-all solution? I think once we are thinking in that one-size-fits-all solution paradigm is where the problems come in it really address this issue. Now, as I say, there are many, 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 many things that need to be said about this, and I have uh, tried to talk about this in many different ways in the past, so I will direct you to some of my previous work on this. For example, there was a, uh, a Boiling Frogs Post eye-opener report from 2012, Outrunning Collapse, the Alternative Currency Solution, talking about different aspects of this problem, what, what an alternative currency means, what it could look like, um, how there could be numerous ones. Uh, for example, complementary currencies, which, of course, uh, complementary, they're a complement, they're not a supplement. So they can exist even alongside fiat currencies, and they can exist alongside each other. They can exist as uh, standalone community currencies, but obviously they will not be the only thing that you use in your everyday life, and that's okay. They don't have to be that total 100%. We have to change over the system completely all at once in a smooth and final process. No, little by little, we can step off of the grid. And I think that's extremely important, uh, strategically as well as uh, what, what in, in ideologically, um, because it comports with the idea of decentralization as the only thing that truly goes against the ideals of centralization that are at the, court, the, the heart of the ideology of oligarchy. Um, now, in that, in that report, again, I'll encourage you to watch it all. We talk about a num number of different complementary currencies and how they were created and how they thrive. Uh, and of course, that obviously involves part of my interview with Paul Glover, um, who created Ithaca Hours. And uh, that's now, what, 30 plus... Or th my math is not working very well today. It's uh, almost 30 years old at this point and has been used to transact literally millions of dollars worth of transactions in Ith Ithaca, New York. Um, now, th the idea of something like Ithaca Hours is only a failure. I mean, that's not a real solution, James. Only if, again, we are thinking in that mindset that it has to be a 100% all or nothing for the entire United States and or Japan and or Canada and or any other country on the planet. It has to completely replace the fiat currency all in one blow, and it has to be a totalizing system that everyone uses all the time in all transactions. If we are thinking in those terms, then yes, things like uh, community currencies, they're silly. They're nothing. They don't bother you. Don't waste your time with that. But if we're not thinking in those terms, then, oh, this is actually something that not only can exist, it already does exist. People are already using some of these alternatives. So it isn't necessarily so that we have to reinvent the wheel every single time we approach this question. The wheel has already been reinvented many, many times. Let's use uh, different wheels. We don't have to use uh, just the one wheel that we've been given. Um, uh, another uh, resource that I'll point you to, I wrote this uh, International Forecaster editorial, How to Beat the Banksters at Their Own Game, talking about some of the different ways that we can subvert the, uh, the, the banksters and the Federal Reserve and their, their ideas for how to, uh, to proceed in society uh, using some of their own, their own ideas and techniques. Um, again, I elaborate that more in this editorial. But uh, all of that is to say that I want to stress that I think the idea, the mindset that people are in, that monetary reform has to be a all or nothing totalizing system that is used to completely replace the existing paradigm. I think that's ultimately the globalist oligarchical idea of monetary reform. That ultimately, as I say, I think they do want to end the Fed eventually. They will end the Fed and they will replace it with... SDRs, IMF uh, runs special drawing rights as a new, you know, global reserve currency paradigm, or, or something along those lines. But you know, the ending the Fed will be in that agenda at some point in the future. So yes, of course, it is a question of how it is done, and I think we have to uh, we have to understand that it isn't. It does not have to be a one hundred percent all or nothing idea that completely replaces it. Now I know that's going to be very unsatisfying answer to uh, some of the people in the crowd because they want that 100%. They want a system that will replace what we have. 
uh, because it is extremely easy to plug yourself into a system. You don't have to do any more research. You can you can research enough to understand that one system and then you're done. And then you can just use that the rest of your life and live happy and free and prosperous. Of course, I don't think that's going to happen. But to at least uh, scratch that itch, which I know does exist, uh, this, is, this is not me trying to avoid the question of what monetary systems do I think would be most useful or most, uh, the, the most resilient or the most sustainable or the most uh, effective at ma- achieving real wealth, not ones and zeros, but real actual productive capacity and ability to, for people to live comfortable lives, which is presumably what any economic system is, is ultimately aiming at. There, there has to be some answers for that. Uh, again, I don't think there will be one answer that we must all sign off on, whether or not we agree with it. But I think there will be some that rise to the top. And one that I've talked about and honed in on specifically in the past is called self-issued credit. Now, this is an idea that goes, uh, well, I, I learned about it and studied it through uh, the work of Paul Grignon, who is the creator of the Money is Debt series of documentaries. As I've mentioned a few times on the podcast in the past, a lot of people are probably familiar with his original Money as Debt uh, documentary. It was a 45-minute or so animated-style documentary. It was quite popular at the time, about 10, 10 years ago, um, online. But very few people are familiar with Money as Debt Two, which he released a few years after, or a couple of years after that, and then Money is Debt Three. I think I might be the only person I know who's actually watched that documentary. Uh, it does get extremely complex. It gets very much into the heart of the monetary m- monetary paradigm. Um, it, it really gets into some some deep delving into the issue and what the problems are and the solutions. But it it does definitely require you to go over it not once or twice, but maybe multiple times in order to really wrap your head around it. But it is exceptionally important. And so as a way of doing, uh, at least pushing people in the direction of looking at this idea that Paul Grignon forwarded in Money is Debt 3, I created this eye-opener report back in 2012, Self-Issued Credit, a Monetary Solution. And note, a monetary solution, not the monetary solution, not the one solution, the one holy ring that everyone must wear, a monetary solution. And uh, I think it is a brilliant idea, a brilliantly designed little system. I don't, again, like any other system. There, There are ways of circumventing it or undermining it. But I think the point is to start thinking of these types of ideas that we absolutely can build upon. And this is a good one. So uh, this is an eye-opener report from 2012. That means it is available on my YouTube channel in preview form. And it's on here on the website in preview form. I am going to append the full report to the end of this video. So the next 20 minutes or so is going to be this self-issued credit report. So you can watch the full thing with a much greater degree of detail uh, than I'd be able to give in a few minute summary here. So uh, that's going to be perhaps the more satisfying answer to people who are looking for that straightforward answer. What is the system that could replace the Federal Reserve note? This, I guess, might be more of a solution up that alley. But as I say, I, I want to stress, it's not the only solution. Uh, There are many, 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 many solutions to this. And here's the funny part about this. I've already been talking for almost 20 minutes. The uh, rest of this video is going to be another 20 minutes. So that's 40 minutes. And this is just answering the seven minute video that uh, Jerry Day has done. And on top of that, I'm directing you to literally hours and hours of (laughs) more programming that I've done in the past uh, talking about this idea. I mean, it is it is exceptionally difficult to encapsulate these ideas in just a few sentences because there are so many different pitfalls. Now, having said all of that, the last thing I'd like to say is that, of course, I am interested in what the Corporate Report community has to say about these issues as well. So if you have uh, specific answers to the questions that Jerry is laying out in his challenge, or if you want to talk about some of the different uh, ideas and paradigms that are being presented in these Corporate Report references, please do so in the CorbettReport.com comment section. I'm looking forward to hearing your take on this. I expect a very intelligent, well-informed, lively uh, debate and and some ideas to be spread through this. So thank you, Jerry, for creating this video on the challenge. Again, I'm going to direct people to Jerry Day's YouTube uh, channel where he does excellent work on a number of different topics that are of interest to Corbett Report listeners as Minivan Jack. The link will be in the show notes as always. And now, without further ado, I present to you Self-Issued Credit, a Monetary Solution. (music) 
welcome. This is James Corbett of The Corbett Report with your eye-opener report for BoilingFrogsPost.com. As the global economy continues to slow down, the world is being asked to focus on issues of so-called sovereign debt, austerity, fiscal responsibility, belt tightening, and other such euphemisms for the grim reality that the public is now being asked to pony up the dough for the trillions that have been handed over to the banksters in the past few years. What the constant focus on these issues effectively hides, however, is that underlying the economic woes that are the symptom of the disease is the disease itself, the monetary system. As monetary reform advocate Bernard Leotard of the University of California points out, this is not by accident. Now, how many of you know the difference between the Nobel Prize of Economics and the other Nobels? Anybody? Yes? What is it? Oh, what's irregular about it? Oh! Which was dominated by monetarists. Oh! This social democratic Gee! Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that is a sufficient answer. <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right. Okay. Now, Paul Krigman told me personally that I was totally crazy to talk about the money issue. He said, have you not, we were both from MIT, okay? We were graduated in the same school. We had the same professors, right? And what he told me, didn't they tell you? Never touch the money system. Never touch the money system. You can touch everything else. Never touch the money system. And the reason is there. You will not be invited in the right places, and you can kiss goodbye on the Nobel on anything else. That is worthwhile getting. You're killing yourself academically if you touch the money system. Although many are ignorant of this fact, the Nobel Prize for Economics is as much of a Nobel Prize as the Federal Reserve is a Federal Reserve. That is, not at all. This doesn't prevent the press from lauding Nobel laureate Paul Krugman for his deep economic wisdom, however, and it doesn't prevent Krugman from using his bully pu pulpit to argue for ever-growing amounts of stimulus spending in a vain attempt to plug the holes in the sinking SS global economy with ever-larger bales of debt-based Federal Reserve notes. So if arguments over sovereign debts and bailouts and stimulus and easing and other forms of tinkering with the current monetary paradigm are not the answer, that begs the question, what is? As we've been examining in previous weeks here on the Eye Opener, the question of monetary reform and alternative currencies lies at the heart of the long-term solution for steering us away from the edge of these systemic fiscal cliffs and towards a system that is inherently rational, equitable, predictable, and sustainable. As everyone who has examined the issue will attest, however, there are a bewildering array of alternative currency systems on offer, from time banks and let systems to TEMs, bitcoins, and privately minted precious metals. For those who are overwhelmed by the variety of choices in the world of alternative currency, it is important to note a basic principle that many of these systems have in common. The idea of self-issued credit. With the way our money system works, when there are plenty of people willing to work, and plenty of people who need their work done, there is often not enough money to allow it to happen. Now, any group can more readily create a currency that they can use for their purposes. Say Billy wanted to buy 10 apples from Alice. They set the price to one unit per apple. In the transaction, Alice receives a credit of 10 units and Billy receives a debt of 10 units. Alice can then spend her 10 with anyone who uses the currency and Billy can make up his 10 by providing something to anyone who uses the currency. In such a system, money is created as needed by people who need it. It is being made to be entirely decentralized with rules that are transparent. With security built into the system as with any account today. This is the beginning of the democratization of money and finance. 
By examining the roots of this idea and combining it with modern breakthroughs in communication and data processing, alternative currency proponent Paul Grignon has proposed Digital Coin, an idea for a global economic system that operates on this principle of self-issued credit. The digital coin is really two coins. The first kind is the perpetual coin, which is permanent and created in limited supply. Perpetual coin is designed to be the value unit of the whole system, like the silver penny in the medieval example. Everything is always priced in perpetual coin. However, its actual presence in trade isn't required because commerce is conducted in the second type of digital coin, the credit coin. Credit coin is an online electronic trading medium issued by producers as virtual goods and services, just like the vouchers issued by producers in the medieval market. Credit coin is spent by the issuer in the process of creating or supplying the issuer's goods and services. For instance, an issuer that was a corporation or government would spend most of its credit coin on the wages of employees. The employees would spend the credit coin at their local stores, who would in turn buy from local or distant suppliers, who would in turn pay their suppliers and employees with it, and they would then spend the same credit coin in their local stores, and so on. Circulated and spent via internet, any given credit coin could travel anywhere enabling any number of transactions having nothing to do with the issuer, just as Anton's bread vouchers could be used to allow the seamstress to buy from the shoemaker, the shoemaker to buy from the butcher, and so on. However, unlike the medieval market, there would be no end of market meeting at which all outstanding credits are brought together to be exchanged and redeemed by the issuer. Therefore, the first refinement the system needs is a built-in incentive to ensure that every credit coin ultimately returns to its issuer. This is accomplished by offering a bonus on redemption. The issuer offers more product if the product is bought with the issuer's own credit coin. Or put another way, the issuer honors its own coin at a higher value than any other. This bonus redemption can be designed so that it is limited to a time period of the issuer's choosing. This sets a target period for maximum redemption, thus making it much more likely that the credit coin will be spent on the issuer's product and services when the issuer wants it to be spent. Of course, there would also be differences in demand for the products and services of individual issuers, and different degrees of issuer reliability. Therefore, credit coins would vary in value over time and go up and down relative to each other, just as national currencies and corporate stocks do today. So the second refinement has to be a means of determining the relative worth of different credit coins as expressed in perpetual coin. This can be accomplished by an automated online marketplace that tracks the value of each issuer's coin by comparing the offers to sell to the offers to buy for that coin. At each transaction, the credit coins involved automatically access this online marketplace and revalue themselves according to the real-time demand for that coin which corresponds directly to the current demand for the issuer's actual products and services. As a basic formula, this is extremely simple. At any given moment, any given credit coin is worth its current buy-sell ratio times one perpetual coin. A perfect balance of trade always results in parity with perpetual coin. To clarify, if buy orders exceed sell orders, the coin will be worth proportionately more than one perpetual coin, and if sell orders exceed buy orders, the coin will be worth less. The value of the coin automatically adjusts to the supply and demand for that coin. As all pricing is expressed in perpetual coin, the issuer will unavoidably take in more of its credit coin per unit of product if the coin is below parity with perpetual coin and less per unit if it is above. 
Therefore, as the issuer's products are sold, any excess or shortage in the supply of that issuer's coin is automatically corrected, pushing the credit coin back towards parity with perpetual coin. This is just one of several powerful features of the proposed digital coin system. In this proposed new system, there is no borrowing from future generations. Money is not abstract, nor is it some item of precious scarcity. It is virtual goods and services, backed by actual goods and services. Spending power is inescapably linked to earning power, and earning power is tied directly to the production of real goods and services. The ins and outs of this digital coin system are complex and are best served by a thorough review of the proposal at digitalcoin.info, but the idea that it operates on is simple and time-honored. As Grignon demonstrates in his other works, just as the ancient marketplace thrived in times of monetary scarcity, a lack of silver or gold coins, by trading credits that were self-issued by reputable businessmen, so too could a global monetary system be arranged, completely eliminating the need for the outdated technology of Federal Reserve notes or central bank-administered national currencies. The implications of this system are enormous. In the digital coin system, money could be split into its function as a unit of measure and a means of exchange. Individuals could issue their own credit and allow it to exchange in the market. Speculation would transform from an endeavor to suck money out of transactions into an endeavor to add value to existing relationships and people would be free to refuse specific credits that had been issued by specific businesses, giving total control up to individuals to choose what groups or businesses they are willing to support. Last year, I had the chance to talk to Paul Grignon about this system on my radio program. And tonight we're talking about a revolutionary idea for a, a completely different way of basing our economy, not on bankster credits that's uh, owed at debt and interest back to the banksters, nor on gold or silver coins, but on self-issued credit, the idea that we can give out vouchers for the goods and services that we will produce in the future. Uh, a simple idea, but revolutionary in so many ways. And there are so many aspects of this that I find really fascinating. And, and it seems to be a system that, that really is based on the idea of, of sustainability, of of some sort of accountability, of, of inherent justice. There are a lot of things that seem built into this system. So I suggest that you go to Money as Debt to start watching the, uh, the documentary and, and finding out more about how this system works. But, uh, but Paul, let's start uh, uh, unpacking this idea of self-issued credit, because as I mentioned, there's such a circularity to the flow of this system that I think is, is really quite parsimonious, kind of beautiful in its own way, but also I think inherently it brings with it some, some aspect of justice. Perhaps you can talk about some of those aspects of, of this um, new, different mon monetary system that you're proposing. Um, the, the circularity is an attempt, I guess, to imitate nature, and it is the fundamental idea of a balanced budget. Ends are produced, and then you earn back when you sell your production. This is what we do now. When you, You're you just letting the bank get in the middle. Uh, the banks don't... I mean, I, I, I get a little... I get a little <laughs> quiver when people say banks create money out of nothing. Uh, no, they don't. They, they create money against an asset, and you're promising to pay it back as the asset that they create the money against. What they are doing is underwriting you because who the hell are you? It's just a problem with self-issue credit is if I, Paul Green, go out and start spending money against my production, well, who the hell am I? <laughs> and nobody's going to trust me, and my production is, is hardly reliable enough to base money on. But a large company is, and any government that collects taxes is. And so more in the collective that this would work rather than at the individual level. But as you noticed in the movie, it's open to anybody. I mean, if you can create a circle of trust, as people do with alternative currencies right now. You can have neighborhood currencies. You can have village currencies. You can have the local currency at any level. And these would all be technologically compatible with the larger ones because they all, as you can see, it was in a total, total libertarian chaos a kind of system where people only accept credits they want to accept. So if I don't want to let Monsanto's credit 
pass through me, I could say no. Can't pass through me. You could boycott any anybody's credit I want, which would add another little arsenal to um, social social exercising the uh, the common will, you know, the people's will. Right. That's an important aspect of this because really, what in such a system, what people are trading is is not these 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 promises uh, that we understand as money today. It's it's really a, a promise to pay a specific good or service from a specific person. So the credit, for example, might have originated with Monsanto or some other identifiable company or or something. And you would know who it is. And right you now, when they borrow money, to say no bank. if you didn't have oh, credit. First to accept it by legal tender laws. And you don't know whose credit it is. It's all anonymous. Uh, and in this other system, that credit would not be anonymous. Everybody who issues it would be known. Another aspect of this that I, I like is the inherent ability to decentralize the system. Because, of course, right now it does function at a national currency level. And things and decisions that are made by, by politicians in a faraway place can have an effect on our savings and our ability to spend and all of this. Which, which again is is a ridiculous system on so many levels. But in the self issued credit system, if you are able, if you are an issuer, then you really do have control over over your own currency. I mean, it, it's 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 really up to you and and to your company or whatever it is, whatever operation that you're you're running. Yes, and the same for government. And in, and the way the uh, automatic, the automated aspects of it work is that you could not get out of whack very far before um, the loss is spread amongst everybody who uses your credit, which would make you very unpopular. And that could become a self-inflicted um, wound. And, you know, there's a strong incentive to total responsibility because there's a huge penalty for irresponsible, and there's actually no way to pile up debt on future generations. That's that's the big, big features I was looking for. All, all money is extinguished within a short time, either redeemed for product or it ceases to exist and hold things over an issuer forever. So the the debts are the debts must be extinguished by their expiry date. Oh, there's all kinds of features. I think that people trading these credits, you know, behind the scenes, what they what they think would would, would provide an enormous amount of anonymous but useful information about consumer preferences and and, and the help the producers plan for realistically. That's, that's if we were in a, an economy where instead of trying to sell everything we can, you know, because we want to make as much money as we can, our goal is simply to supply the people's needs the most efficient way possible. Right, exactly. All right, well, let's pick it up from there. Let's take a few minute break and we'll be right back with Paul Grignon. Once again, 1 800 313 94. Obviously, we are still light years off from implementing such a system, not necessarily due to the technological impediments, though there are those, but because the idea of monetary reform is still far from the minds of the public, who are generally too busy chasing those Federal Reserve notes or euros or yen or pesos or pound to contemplate what it is that forms the basis of our entire economic existence. And if Krugman and the so-called Nobel laureates and the central bankers and all the others who benefit the most from our current economic paradigm get their way, that profound state of ignorance will never be disturbed. For those of us who do know about the possibilities of alternative currencies and new monetary paradigms to solve many of the most intractable economic problems that we're facing, it's incumbent upon all of us to better inform ourselves about these issues and to start raising the awareness of those around us before we are all driven off the bankster-created fiscal cliff.